Hello, and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive director of the fellowship program. The Institute is one of the world's leading centers for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring students, scholars, artists, and practitioners together to pursue curiosity-driven research, expand human understanding, and grapple with questions that demand insights from across disciplines. You can be a part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collections held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit radcliffe.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Roger Reeves. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce the Suzanne Young Murray Fellow, Roger Reeves. Professor Reeves is an Associate Professor of English and Creative Writing at the University of Texas at Austin. His poems have appeared in the American Poetry Review, The New York Times, Best American Poetry 2014, Boston Review, The New Yorker, Plowshare, Poetry, and Tin House, among other publications. His poetry draws from rich and varied sources and broadly investigates the intricacies of language and history. His debut poetry collection, King Me, won the Levis Reading Prize from Virginia Commonwealth University and the John C. Zachary's first book award from Plowshares and the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Book Award. Throughout the collection, Professor Reeves assumes identities ranging from a horse witnessing the lynching of Emmett Till to Mikhail Bulgakov recounting the forced famines in Poland in the 1930s. By adopting this persona, he investigates the violence and politics of poverty, gender, race, and self. At Radcliffe, Professor Reeves is working on several projects, including finishing his second book of poems, Best Barbarian, which will mediate upon the place of ecstasy in protest, particularly in regards to the recent protests around the white supremacy and state violence against black folks in the United States. Instead of simply witnesses, um, witnessing Americans' current racial movements and reckonings, or trying to chronicle them, Professor Reeves is envisioning the poems in Best Barbarian as an extension of the protest, an aesthetic extension of a call for change, a call for an aesthetic future, a call for ecstasy in the middle of the ongoing catastrophe of anti-Blackness in America. Using the three verse, as well as more traditional forms such as the abecedarian, elegy, and low and ode, these poems involve the singing of James Baldwin, the images, details, and metaphors of the current protest movement, the ontology and epistemology of the Hush Harbor, and subversive sites of study during slavery to create a long song that sings out the munificence of Black life. Best Barbarian will be published by W.W. W. Norton next month. Professor Reeves earned his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. He was awarded, awarded a 2015 Withing Award, two Pushcarts Prizes, a Hodder Fellowship from Princeton University, and a 2013 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, and a, 20, and a 2008 Ruth Lilly Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Roger Reeves. Rich Black or Best Barbarian. When our consent was against our will, as in it is said during slavery, Negro children were encumbrances, often advertised in evening papers as lanyap, the petite largesse of luxury living, as in Scipio baptized 1760, likely Negro boy, about a month old to be given away into the sea as in below the harbor near Edisto Island, Ebos swung low in the chariot of their calling to be carried home and walked on the bottom of water, 
until handsome, honed, as in the way we lay, we mimed a body of water, so died for the want of water, bearing this plow and flower, this bit and scold's bridle, this mewling leather, this blood loss, this goodbye gone, but one gone ain't always equivalent to another, as in all silences are not the same, as in all money ain't good money. What silences are you responsible for? What gems have you jiggered into crows, conjoled to sing in the pines and pages of poetry magazines for a prize? As in, there is no succinct definition of exile. As in, black is the black ain't. As in, everywhere the bucks went clattering, the police bristled in the way. As in, form forgets fugitivity is the original human form. As in, best put on your best barbarian. As in, this gospel is large enough that anything can be said about me and you, your mama and your cousin too, rolling down the strip on Vogue's, waking up slamming Cadillac doors, outcast and out of gas, the empire smiles in its guillotine and Gucci loafers, as if to say, I practice the abundance of zero. As in, the world is always ending while someone is and ain't being born, as in motherfuck the weather, come and join the band of wild Negroes, dancing the antelope and holy ghosts in Gadsden, Gassimity, and Georgia, as in leave the angel to his centuries of death, leave the police dog of our future in his heavy paws, below the whites only signs and water fountains, dreaming of bucks between his teeth and a healthy 401k or Roth IRA to ease into old age and the arthritis of chasing everywhere the bucks go clattering, as in the black and blur or the bright blur of black, as in the Negro must be still, must still be moving, which is the original cinematic motion of ghosts gardens and ex-slaves, as in address yourself only to freedom, to the seed, the forest, the swamp, the night, the rain, the river, the rat, the snake, the panther, the tree, leaping in and out of its green breath. Thank y'all so much for uh, coming to my uh, Radcliffe talk. Uh, it's been a great year so far. Um, met some really excellent fellows. And the reason I started that way is uh, it, I've been in conversation with a friend of mine, Soma Sharif, and we've, she uh, brought back to my attention the Barbara Christian article, uh, the, race, the Race for Theory, when Barbara Christian 88 writes that uh, Black art, Black poetry uh, theorizes itself. We don't necessarily need to use an Althusserian or Marxist framework to understand labor or power. The work itself gives us the framework, right? The syntax, uh, the diction choices uh, in themselves are theorizing uh, th their experience, they're theorizing how to read them, right? And so I wanted to sort of start with Outcast because, and start with my own poem, because there's a way in which for me, uh, this talk is really comes out of that first verse where Andre says, trying to catch the feeling off instrumentals. And so this talk is really uh, inspired by this idea of trying to catch the feeling or trying to write out, out of sonic material, right? And for me, the sonic materiality of Outcast was how I stepped into writing. I remember listening to it, uh, listening to uh, Aquemini as an undergraduate and deciding, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be a poet. This, this is what I want to do. And I remember listening to Liberation, which is one of the last tracks on Equimini. Um, And so for me, when I'm thinking about like, you know, what some people might call Keatsian notions of like uh, negative capability, I think about the way Outcast actually uses uh, doubt to make work, right? Like when Andre's like, I'm trying to catch that feeling off instrumentals, right? And he's looking at ceiling fans go round, right? Or he says, we're catching a bus on, uh, you know, the 86 to Lithonia, you know, I've actually caught that bus, <laughs> but also I know what it is to ride the Marta. And so I'm thinking, so for me in this talk, what I wanna do is sort of think through some of the sonic material uh, that contributes and is this, uh, this sort of um, what we might call the patterning that occurs in, in this book. 
So some of the references, just to give you from the first poem, like the first line when our consent was against our will is actually a borrowed line from uh, Black Thoughts uh, Freestyle that went viral a few years ago um, on uh, Hot 97. And he just did this amazing 10 minute freestyle. And I love this idea of when our consent was against our will. Cause I think there is uh, something to, to me to that, that talks about sort of the long history of blackness right there. Um, there's reference uh, obviously to Outkast, me and you, your mama and your cousin too from Elevators, which was the first song Elevators, uh, as well as uh, later from Vibrate from uh, The Love Below, Outkast. So there's gonna be like tons of referentiality. But, and the last one I'll leave with you before I move on to our next song is, uh, I happened to be at the Reina Sofia in Madrid a few years ago, and there was a retrospective of the Cuban surrealist Wilfredo Lamb. And Ame Cesaire, who is a Martinican surrealist poet, who is very famous, uh, Andre Breton said, you know, this was the surrealist we were looking for. When we, when surrealism was sort of coming to be, they had no idea that someone like Ame Cesaire was in Martinique or in France, already sort of making surrealist poetry. But Cesaire writes of, uh, writes of Wilfredo Lamb, he says, he's writing this criticism up of me, but it's very beautiful criticism, but he says, Wilfredo Lamb addresses himself only to freedom. And I think about sort of my poetics is this, like I'm, I wanna get to the place and I feel like I'm doing that a bit, is addressing myself only to freedom. Um, so uh, the next clip we're gonna listen to is James Baldwin, uh, but it's not James Baldwin as you've heard him before. Grendel, all lions must lean into something other than a roar. James Baldwin, for instance, singing Precious Lord. His voice is weary as water broken over his scalp and a storefront sanctified church's baptismal pool all those years ago when he wanted to be somebody's child and on fire in that being, Lord, I want to be somebody's child and chosen water spilling over their scalp. Water taking the shape of their longing. A deer diving into evening traffic and the furrow drawn in the air over the hood of the car, power. And wanting to be something alive and open. Lord, I want to be alive and open. A glimpse of power the shuffle of a mother's hand over a sleeping child's forehead as if clearing the city's rust from its face, which we mostly are, a halo of rust, a glimpse of power. James Baldwin leaning into the word light, his voice jostling that single grain in his throat as if he might drop it or already has. I am calling to that grain of light, to the gap between his teeth, where the many of us fatherless sleep and bear and be whatever darkness or leaping thing we can be. In James Baldwin's mouth, my difficult beauty, my weak and worn, my future is any number of angels, which is not unlike the beast Grendel coming out of the wild heaven into the hills and halls of the meat house at the harpist call with absolute prophecy in his breast and a desire for mercy for a friend an end to drifting in loneliness. And in that coming down out of the hills, out of the trees for once, bringing humans the best vision of themselves, which of course must be slaughtered. So uh, I've been thinking, I remember hearing that uh, archival uh, recording of James Baldwin singing uh, many years ago and just playing it over and over and over again. There was something in it to me that I didn't hear when I was reading or listening to Baldwin's speeches, right? We hear a weariness, we hear a type of vulnerability. Um, and I was interested in writing into that space. Uh, there. I felt like that Baldwin that we hear in this clip 
doesn't always make it into our, hagi our hagi hagiographic renderings of Baldwin now. Um, and I felt like there was so much there in this clip. So there's several, so, I've, so in this collection, there are several things that sort of reference Baldwin um, and think about Baldwin. Um, and the, the tie in with Grendel is I've always thought of, like, I've always loved the epic of, of Beowulf. Um, and I've always thought that Grendel was like probably the first black man in literature, right? Like I've always imagined that Grendel was probably, you know, as all mythological things are based in something real. And it probably was an African man that lived in, <laughs> in, in his mother, right? Or a community of black folks living quite far north and they were sort of made out to be monstrous, right? Um, and so I've always, you know, sort of in the John Gardner fashion or even in the Toni Morrison essay where she called Grendel's mother, where she thinks about, you know, uh, why Grendel, Grendel's mother is never named, right? Grendel gets a name, but all she is, all Grendel's mother is, is Grendel's mother. Um, and so I've been really thinking about thinking into these sort of gaps, these lacuna in, uh, in our Western canon in a lot of ways. So the next poem, again, is thinking about James Baldwin, but he's, it's thinking about Baldwin a little differently. Um, <laughs> It's thinking about Baldwin as a type of poetics, right? And so what I mean by that is Baldwin as um, an aesthetic way of being in the world or aesthetic way of rendering sound and possibly organizing what we might call like experience, right? And so one of the things that I think about Baldwin is I think of him as a fugitive thinker, right? As someone who was an expat who lived in France then lived in Turkey, uh, he was sort of fugitive. And so it made me think about this other term, uh, dropatomania. I don't know if you've ever heard of this term, but dropatomania is um, an alleged uh, psychological illness that caused enslaved Black folks to run away. And it was put forth by this physician named James A. Cartwright. So it's this idea that Oh, he, black folks must have been crazy to why would they want to flee slavery, right? And so it must so, you know, this is all that, you know, and this was a legitimate sort of uh, thought at, at some point in the 19th century, right? Um, so uh, in this poem, I sort of ironize and play in that objection, that abjection in the poem. And I do that through thinking about form, right? If we think about form, and obeying form, right? And if we think about form as an announcement of power, right? Then to obey a form is to sort of be contained within it. Um, and so I wanted to think about what is it to be in a form and then sort of become fugitive in the form. And one of the ways that I think about that sort of elasticity or is, and I'm thinking about it in this poem through the absidarian. The absidarian is A, B, C, D, E. So it's like those poems we did when we were in like first grade, A is for apple, B is for boy, C is for cat who I love so much. You know, so I'm playing in this idea of the absidarian. A more rigorous absidarian is Inger Christensen's The Alphabet. It's an amazing absidarian. One of the most amazing book length poems I've ever read. Um, Terrence Hayes also plays with the absidarians in, in a more recent book called American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. One of the sonnets is an absidarian. So I'm riffing off of uh, the absidarian and sort of becoming fugitive with it. But I'm also using another constraint, which slavery had many sort of modes of surveillance. So I'm thinking about other forms and I'm using what's called a 14er, uh, a 14 line stanza. Now the 14er or 14 line stanza really sort of is me speaking back to John Ashbery in some ways, because his first few books had a lot of 14ers. Right. So I'm playing in the tradition and riffing away from the tradition. Those are some of the sort of, just to give you a background, some of the stuff you won't be able to see, but you'll be able to hear. There's also, also quite a lot of bit of referentiality. I love illusion. We can talk about that later. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm riffing off of, you'll see Thomas Jefferson in this, uh, Notes on State of Virginia. You'll see Kathy Cohen, the scholar Kathy Cohen, uh, amazing queer uh, theorist. Uh, you'll hear a reference to some of her work. Uh, you'll hear a lot of different things. Uh, so I would say this is a poem to sort of enjoy, kind of like you enjoy your favorite song, right? Uh, turn in, you know, tune in, tune out, but like, it's about the sort of sonic play. So this is called Drop A to Mania or James Baldwin as an Improvisation. Absent bounty, anarchic and asymptotic. Bedlam banked is beauty. 
captive cuckolding capital and its camel faced captor, master, the devil is in the dove's details. Even doves exist as furious, fragile, violent, and decent, which could describe anyone at all, including freedom. Even freedom exists. God's good hostage, haint haunting the hoot nanny. If, as in the if only you knew of Patty LaBelle, sung in the broken bottle falsetto of an uncle laid out on the bottom step of summer sobriety and miss such a much as sliding away love, jaundice as James Baldwin's good and lovely dying eye. James Baldwin existed as an improvisation, knuckles calling for a new port to knock, light, lift, lustrous and otherwise, Malcolm X marking X where it is he loved the poor, everywhere, everywhere, which is where Detroit is red, recalcitrant, panther, battlefield, where the moon says, I love you, naysayers, narcoleptics, no names, nap deprive, on time and out of time, queer, the color of how we made it over empire, petulance, pneumonia, the nubs, net pain, needles nosing in our Nana's uterus, notices of eviction, notes on the state of Virginia, and how Negroes ain't shit but buckra beaters, bears, butches, bull daggers, and welfare queens, sometimes cute, coons, country, cow tipped, downward dogs, earth empty, flies, fungible, freaks, gutter rough, hasslers, hijinks, handsome in harnesses, ignorant as ice, Jurid juridical conundrums, nappy kitchens, kaput, light and heavy work, madnesses, martyr and minor mayhem, misled draped maniacs, nothing worth noting, a now made then, occult and organized as outlandish, pariahs, presidents, quarrelsome, roustabouts and randy, skit, scat and shat, tercentennial and tough going, Mulattoes, tragic and otherwise, translated as any number of ain'ts, apocalypses, unaffiliated and unctuous, various and varicose, vestibules of the new world, remnants of light from a cigarette balanced between the knuckles of James Baldwin's hand, leopard, the remnants of light exist, wayward as any many and less, where the moon feels the night and the shadow of a boy running through an unplowed field turns the earth turns the earth round, gold, back against the bedlam of being hunted by any X, Y, and Z. You, you, who have survived the dead in this earth. So uh, let's listen to some more music. I'm gonna play next for you. I'm not gonna play all the songs because we don't have time for that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna play for you uh, a few songs that contribute to this long poem that I kind of see as an improvisation. Um, and it's the, the poem is called Something About John Coltrane. And in the poem, I use what I call a durational form. So I'm using a form that is long as the song, Alice Coltrane's song, Something About John Coltrane. Uh, so um, there's something to know about that. Um, and the song Alice Coltrane makes something about John Coltrane is kind of an elegy and an ode and an extension of John Coltrane's thinking, uh, John Coltrane's musical ideas, uh, including she's playing in some of the keys that John, uh, John Coltrane liked to play in. Uh, I'm also gonna play a tune, uh, part of a tune called uh, Afternoon of a Georgia Fawn by a guy named Marion Brown. And Marion Brown was this avant-gardist jazz, um, jazz cat uh, who ha had like Chick Corea playing like sticks and they're playing water. Uh, and this tune, I just kept listening to it over and over while I was making this, this poem. And it contributes to how I'm thinking about improvisation. Again, the poetic. So for instance, there's this notion of um, that Ornette Coleman came up of territory and adventure. Right. When we normally think of jazz improvisation, if we know a little bit about music, then we know that the improvisation happens over the same uh, harmonic structures as what's called the A section. Right. So the section where, you know, the, the tune is played, the tune we like, if we think about my favorite things, do, 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 right. Like, and then somebody will improvise using those same key changes 
but they're kind of locked into that harmonic structure. Ornette Coleman had this idea that that section could be very small and we could adventure away from it harmonically, rhythmically, melodically, and we should sort of explore it, it and move away. So I'm really thinking about that, particularly in light of this interview that Derrida did with, or this discussion between Derrida and Ornette Coleman. Um, and I think about this quite often with uh, free jazz and sort of late Coltrane is trying to make the beginning of the song extinct or irrelevant, such that one can't go back to the beginning. One has sort of traversed a musical landscape enough that like this thing right here, this idea is outdated. Um, and so I've been thinking about that uh, musically. And the last thing we'll listen to is a little Aretha Franklin. Uh, so I'll play these three for you and then I'll read the poem and it'll probably be the last poem I read. So let's, uh, let's give it a little listen. We could stay there all day and listen to Aretha sing that song. That's that, ooh, she takes you out on that song. Trust me, trust me. Something about John Coltrane. Something about a tree in shallow sleep, listening for what it wants to remember, the note of a seed, its neck sliding through dirt in its confusion, nothing cleansed of struggle, the weight lost after death, a confrontation of death. John Coltrane, even in death, is a perfect instrument of water, and working the day past its zero, the fires in the trees, a legless rabbit drifting across the sky, dream of a mule covered in crows opened in front of a mule covered in crows, their wings beating against him like skin, an autumn tree in autumn watching fire autumn the other trees. It doesn't have to make sense now. It can make sense later on a mule covered in crows. Sometimes you want, you got to stick a little grass in your mouth to sound like God, allow crows. Something about John Coltrane. Something about the bells in a fawn's hair. A black boy standing in the rain at the edge of the road, wondering how to cross it without summoning his death or its handmaidens. The grasshoppers clicking against him like he's the water the world has been meaning to come to all the world's water trapped inside him and needing to be let out. Something about water waking a ghost, the ghost waking a seed, rain in the hair of the world, and the world opening its sudden flesh, the way stone opens sound against it, a bridge thrown from one absence to another, as if to say extinction, I can live there too. Something about Marion Brown. In a Georgia afternoon, the fawn listens to the Holy Ghost in a trickle of water and is suddenly thrown down on the floor of a sanctified church. The woman's feet lifting, stomping against the wooden boards and God somewhere he ain't supposed to be or be momentarily wasp in the hedge, sheltering from the rain. A woman's skirt hoisted and gladdened above her knee. The hem, the hem of her garment touched by the fawn's eye and holy, holy, holy is thy name. And the snow the woman becomes on the floor and the water ticking against the bottom of the pail. And Lord, the bridge opening above the fawn in the air. And he is what memory permits, pine needles turning on the skin of a bucket of water, a bare shoulder in the rain. God somewhere, he ain't supposed to be. Something about Marion Brown. When the light came to the Georgia fawn, it was in a trickle of water, a brown leaf suddenly underfoot in the spring's ringing green. The leaf underfoot spoke, speaks, became a ladder of tongues, ghost in the good wood a house fire needs. Yes, good God, good God, yes, became the pleasure of placing your mouth, oh yes, Lord, right here, right now, Lord, on something holy and holding it there until every sound in you becomes water, water moving over stone, moving in the hair of the trees, moving over the breast of the bee, beaver, buck of the day, its brown shoulder bearing the hesitant light, its crown and thorn, water moving over the infinite gates of the city, moving as the wing of the wasp, which is the voice of God, water moving over the two realms of the body, moving as the name of God, something is coming to kill him and something is coming to be born. Today, he is both something beyond blood, wasp somewhere in the hedge, sheltering from the rain.
something about Aretha Franklin. Cousin Mary, don't weep. The eternal without the wound of eternity begins now. Sometimes you can be made more than your body while still in your body. Now that's power. A dog suddenly crying in the stables for no other reason than something lifted in him in the afternoon, lifted way up and shook him into a moan and a blade of grass gathered by a gale wind into a speaking thing. Just ask the Georgia fawn, all caught up in some running and gladdened by it. Happy is what the old folks say. The boy, happy, happying in the field with nothing more than his body and the dark landing its dark against him. It doesn't have to make sense now. It can make sense later on. The fawn coming in the rain, the dark bending about him. Power, Cousin Mary. Power in the fawn climbing into the tree as the dark earth flying and the clouds coming together above him, and no danger, no danger to hanging in the lower heavens as a bell, as foreign pollen breaking in the wind, scattering its brown voice on anything that will bear and not bear its gold, vine, fence, a pail of water, the exposed shoulders of God. Now that's power, Cousin Mary, and nothing dying rudely before a dream of the rude. The dream of this tree is not what will die in it, but what will live upside down in the rain, trying its voice in heaven and on earth. Power, eternal power, Cousin Mary, don't weep. Something about a dream of a tree. Something about a mule covered in crows, the mule ridden by a fawn with bells in his hair, and the boy ringing across the field, and the field ringing across the boy, and all this ringing opening and with and full of and tearing and the silk skin of and glory and the hem of a garment and help me holy ghost and yes lord yes and the tiny racket a seed makes cracking open in the dark and the stone in the field worshiping the field by letting the day fall all about it without moving and the dusk riding the rain and the tree dreaming and the light the light without confession castigation or beauty but beauty and the fawn thrown down in a memory of once watching a hawk plucking red coins from the breast of a squirrel and the fawn mimicking the hawk, his head dipping forward in the gesture of prayer, his mouth working against the wind, the invisible breast and belly of an animal and the seed of something opening inside him for which there was no source. So call it mercy, grace or nothing but becoming power, prayer, hawk, the dream of a tree, the dream also an autopsy, what came in the middle of the night, a tree muttering about the muddle of fragrance, wounded sky bewound in light, morning misted in murder, maggots chattering, dawn's red rousing, calling it milk, my Cherie Amour's mystic wobble, the autopsy also a dream, what came, a boy who found his work on the road and had to lie down there with his work, the hostility, of living between the bullets and the bullets hanging you against the night by the lapel for examination, for a song, for the smiths of gold, for gold, for the gallows, for the fragrance of a field covered in crows and the crows lifting as if a great black tent rising to shield the field from pestilence, but the crows just rising crows, the fragrance of freedom, but not freedom itself. And here, silence, what came in the middle of the night, an autopsy, a dream, a boy on the road, crows bowing and bowing to the dead. Something about Michael Brown. Something about Mahalia Jackson's wig, the crow and angel of it, its closer walk with Jesus, with thee, satisfied, lonely, holy, ghost, blessed, enraptured, actual and otherwise. Her wig, a walking on of water with the faith of a wig, each wave of black hair, a pew strapped to the forehead of prayer and singing all in it. What's it all about is burning beyond loss, learning to rise in and out of disaster, smelling of smoke that can heal the sick, wild cathedral in the wilderness, opening itself to any light, dream or drum or song unhitched from heaven. And the mules and men get so happy, hallelujah, they strut, brown suited, the wound in light, like bowleg Louis Armstrong at the Newport Jazz Festival, 1970. Mahalia Jackson lining out ecstasy and sweating through it until it can do nothing but rain 
And the second line, confused, leaf strewn, late, limps onto st stage. But Mahalia Jackson's wig keeps flying and the rain touches evening's brow, bringing with it the stars. And Mahalia Jackson's wig is flying as if a star suddenly freed from the mouth of God, a black tooth blessing. No longer, no longer shall you take things second or third hand. Joy, ecstasy, pleasure, the blessing of sitting in the rain while gathered in the hair of some tree because Mahalia Jackson's wig is flying and the dead for once are dancing too in the rain. Thank y'all. Held y'all a little longer. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. We, we just keep going. It's fine. It's fine. And I'm sure we could stay here the rest of the day listening to you. Uh, wonderful job, really. Uh, but there are questions. Sure, let's, let's answer some questions. Absolutely. So let me tell you the first one, which is um, quite interesting. I love that you have shared so much music in this reading. Had you thought about a multimedia project or release to go with your upcoming work? Oh, yeah, I would love to do. Actually, if this talk were happening in person, I would have did it. I'd have brought up a DJ friend of mine and I, I would have we would have woven. We would have woven 40 minutes of sound as well as image. For instance, I would have probably showed you the uh, Newport Jazz Festival 1970. and would have showed you some other things. Some and so, yes, I would love to do. Uh, multimedia. I have all these like grand designs, even if like filmic representations of the book. Uh, but you know, like I'm a I'm a lowly poet. My technology skills are a little low, but I would love to do that. So yes, 100%. I'm sure you put the bug in someone's mind. So let's see where it goes. Uh, your poetry has such rhythm and cadence. Cadence. In your uh, drafting process, how do you manage those inevitable battles between choosing a word or a phrase? Uh, for its meaning or for its sound and contribution to the rhythm and flow of the poem? It's a great question. Um, one of the things is poetry is sound first, right? So we're, we're moving through and with sound, right? So sound guides, it, right? But there's many ways to think about like sound um, for in, in sense, right? Um, you know, Stevie Wonder says, what do I do when I do when you do, right? Or he's, you know, Stevie Wonder often breaks in what feels like you know speaking in tongues of glossolalia and that makes a type of sense so for me i'm okay if the semantic sense is thrown but the sonic sense is what because i think that sonic sense is a type of sense making right it's a more intuitive sense making um i think it takes the lyric poem back to its base which is music and that's lyrical sort of um understandings so i think it's a you can balance both um and i think that what I'm interested in doing often is when I follow sound, sound is all, to be honest with you, is much smarter than I am. And what I mean by that is I'm pulling, I'm, every word I use has, you know, a, a history of it that's much larger, longer than the history of me being on the earth. Uh, and so what I get to do is bring all that with me. And that's, that sort of, that sonic history can inform the next line. So if I hear a word, I'm just like, oh, that's what I hear. I'm gonna put it down and try to make it make sense later, sonically, or even rhythmically, or even ideationally, or thinking about it aesthetically, or what ideas does this sound now offer me as a possibility. So for me, I think it about those moments of listening to the poem as propelling me to, to a different sensibility or to a different way of being in the poem. Um. I love the way you blend formalist poetics from uh, uh, form, sorry, with popular culture. Do you also do the same in the classroom as a means of introducing students to literature from the canon, of, from the canon be, uh, be Wolf or Baldwin? Yeah, uh, 100%. I, use, I teach this class on the elegy. I used to teach, I haven't taught it much recently, but I teach it to undergrads. And surprisingly, it's a really popular class. You would think that a, a class about like grief and sadness would not be the class uh, undergrads would run to at nine in the morning, but they, they flock to it. Um, and what I do is I love to teach, I'll give you an example. I love teaching Milton's Lycidas, which is uh, Milton, John Milton, famous, you know, poet, Paradise Lost, uh, you know, tetrometer, English canon, you know, canonical poet who writes about a friend, a young friend who gets a commission. He's a minister. He gets sent to 
his first post and dies in a boat, dies in a wreck and, and drowns. But the poem feels very contemporary and modern in certain ways. And what I do is I like to teach that with Peter Sachs's uh, critical essay on like basically like the moves in an elegy, like every elegy, English elegy is gonna do these sorts of things. And what I do is I actually teach that and we like go through it. And then I teach Tupac's God Bless the Dead. And Tupac makes this, Tupac makes a very formalist, very English elegy in this song, right? Like he does everything. He has the political, he turns to the political, the desire to sort of bring back the dead. And it's, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, I do that. Um, often I also try to get my students to think about the ways in which they're already inculcated with a type of poetics that they're, they, most communities have a sense of poetics. And I ask them to bring in this sensibility. Um, I'm, I teach in Texas. Um, and one of the things I think about is like the difference between swagger and persona, right? So if we're teaching persona poem, right? Like one of the things I think is uh, in persona in poems, right? Like I think about Ashbury's having a type of persona, right? A type of swagger. I also teach like uh, Mike Jones or I'll teach some Swisher House, right? To talk about like how Houston has a type of persona or to think about chopped or another way is to think about like chopping and screwing. Right, um, sonically, what? Uh, so, yeah, I definitely, that's that's what I do. Um, the next question: A lot of people think of music as a series of sonic events arranged by people, but there's something uh, richly dynamic about silence. As a poet who is clearly deeply influenced by musical content, how do you interpret and compose or consider silence as a sound within your work? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the beautiful things is that silence is sort of inbuilt in the poem through the line break, right? Uh, and, you know, um, and, and, and rhythm. So because I think of silence as this uh, completely disruptive and then organizing principle. Um, again, uh, yesterday as we were in a talk and I was saying, I read a quote uh, from someone who said, silence is the most accurate sound. Um, and so one of the ways I think about silence in my own work is through the line. Um, where does the line end? How am I thinking about ending lines? For instance, if I'm using uh, a, a, a rhythmic, you know, metrical line versus a free verse line, um, and then within the line, there can be silences, cejures. Um, this is why I'm a big fan. This is probably outdated, but this is why I'm a big fan of punctuation at times, is punctuation is itself types of silences and pauses and rests. A comma is not a semicolon, right? Um, and a period in the middle of a line is not um, is not a dash, um, and so I think uh, those are ways that silence um, is in the work. And then also I think about how we imagistically can render silence, right? I think about in the poem Grendel, where I say um, a mother is uh, rubbing a halo on a child's head, right? right? I think about that moment of her touching her child. It's kind of a silent moment, right? It's, it's pregnant, it's full of something, full of meaning, full of love, full of tenderness, but it's actually pretty silent. Um, and I think I've, I think about like silence in the city, uh, I think because of living in Chicago for so long, um, silence becomes very different in a city. Um, John Cage says that like the sort of ambient sounds of the city is the new silence. He said this in a late interview. Um, so I think, you know, silence, I actually write about, I have an essay coming out uh, this spring on singing into silence and certain types of how to preserve silences as, during political uh, protest. And um, uh, I look at this moment where this opera singer, singer in Chile sings out of her window to defy a, a noise ordinance that the Chilean government um, put, put, uh, put on. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm always, silence is actually something I'm always thinking about. Um. For you, how does being fugitive in a form differ from breaking form? That's a great question. That's a great question. So, all right. So I'm reading this book. It's going to seem like a detour, but I'm reading this book uh, on Maroons. So Black folks that ran away, uh, particularly in North America and in the U.S., from slavery, but but lived in the woods. They didn't join maroon communities like the great, but they actually like lived independently, autonomously in the woods, right? And I think, and, and so, which is different than what I think we think of when we think of black folks running from slavery, 
where they run north or they run and take up with with native folks in Florida or they get back, you know, they they run, you know, it, run to Mexico, right? That's what we normally think of as a type of fugitivity, right? But I think there's many ways of being fugitive, right? And and so one of the and one of the things I think is important as we're thinking about like practices of liberation and freedom is to understand the many ways that one can sort of be liberating oneself. Um, and so when I, so in terms of poetic practice, right? Um, I think that, for instance, there is a way in which breaking form to me is like, okay, the sonnet, for instance. An easy way of breaking the sonnet would be, you know, 14 and a half lines, right? Where you're still sort of moving through the same material, like the dilemma, one might say, in a sonnet, right? A sonnet is always like, you know, if we think about Shakespeare's sonnets, like, you know, the love sonnet, which is, hey, you know, I love you, but you don't seem to be returning it. If you don't, you know, you're going to get old, so you might not be as fly. So, you know, return my love, right? It's not a great piece of argumentation, but that is in one of the, right? So what if you took that and extended that over 16 lines, right? Or you change where the vault is, right? To me, that's breaking form, for instance, if, um, but one can be, you know, one can be fugitive in the form by turning that poem that I think one, like do, doing something inside of a poem that, no one ever expected or living inside a form in a way that we haven't lived inside of it before, right? Which gets to a type of marinage, right? Um, so I think that can be sort of living in form, right? And I think all of these can be played with in, in various ways, but that's a quick answer. I could, I could give, like, I think for instance, I may say Zaire's preliminary question is a great example of um, sort of being fugitive. Uh, it's in Solar Throat Slash. Uh, where it literally it's a, it's someone is being interrogated by the colonial force and then the poem starts and then it like has these really long lines after having a very tight almost trimeter sort of feel in the first three lines so I think that like there's many ways to physically enact uh, this sort of politics or this poetics and there is a question about when your poems are going to be published, and I think it's going to be next month. Is that right? Right, March 2022. Go get Perfect. this barbarian, y'all. You got it. Wonderful. Thank you, Roger, for your absolutely wonderful, wonderful presentation and thoughtful perspectives. Uh, I also want to thank you, uh, thanks the audience for the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Radcliffe uh, virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of, of past events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. And with that, have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye.